Yes. And as Sherry mentioned, it is a stunningly beautiful day out. And I saw the first signs of daffodils popping up on the way to work. And it's just a time of transitions as we are starting to first see spring here and just offer a sense of gratitude for the lands that we come together to learn on today. And really through these diverse lens and experiences that we're bringing today, appreciation for this diversity. And just taking and thanking each of you for taking the time over the next hour to be present as we consider how the methods we use as health services and policy researchers can help support principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And as we listen today to Sohila and Dorsa present, I think it's particularly important for us to consider the biases that we each bring to our work, particularly with AI, natural language processing. And I know they'll both be talking about that today, but again, just for each of us to think about that and really think about how we can use these new technologies to inform health policies and decisions to help better support a more equitable system. And so I'm so thrilled today to introduce Sohila, and I'm so sorry if I'm like, not doing this very well. So Hila Nadalian and Dorsa Garamani, sorry, I butchered that completely, you can correct me, um, who are here to talk about natural language processing and healthcare. So we've been kind of musing about this talk for a few months now, so it's exciting to see this come to life. So Hila is a data analyst here at HISPRI and working on and supporting the OHDPQ project. Um, she has a master's in AI and systems design, and so her focus really is looking at data analytics, machine learning, natural language processing, so th really thrilled to uh, get her expertise today. Uh, Doris is also a data analyst at HISPRI, also supporting the Ontario Health Data Platform Queen's projects. She has a master's degree in health systems engineering and system science, and her expertise is around data analytics, machine learning, data science, and developing healthcare data-driven tools. So you can see how lucky we are to have them here at Queen's and how they're gonna help walk us through natural machine learning today. So I'm really excited to learn more myself. So I'm handing the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for these Method Mondays. Uh, we are excited to have you all here and hopeful you'll find this presentation helpful. Today, uh, we will present about natural language processing in healthcare, which is a very hot topic these days. And you uh, hear NLP everywhere, every day. And um, before that, let's start with uh, introducing ourselves. My name is Dorsa Bahramani. I'm a data analyst at History and working on uh, OHDPQ projects, um, and Sohela is my colleague. She is also a data analyst at History, and she has an extensive knowledge in uh, these methods. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, so uh, I will start with what is natural language process, processing, its application in general, NLP in healthcare, and then I will hand it over to Sohela and she will explain it in more details. Uh, she will discuss about techniques and tools, challenges, limitations, and the future direction. Uh, what is natural language processing? Natural language processing is a field exactly in the intersection of three different fields, computer science, artificial intelligence, and linguistics. Natural language processing designed to enable computers to understand human language. It uses algorithms to extract meaning from unstructured human languages. And uh, these languages might be in a spoken way or written format. 
the aims of NLP is to bridge this gap, the gap between human and computer. There are too many applications for NLP in general, every day, every time. We are using NLP in our routine life. life. For example, language translation, email filtering, a smart assistant, document analysis, etc., are the example of NLP in general. Let's start with sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is the process of analyzing text to understand, to determine if the emotion of uh, emotional tone of uh, this text is positive, negative, or neutral. For example, in Amazon, there are too many reviews, and Amazon can easily, automatically, with using NLP, understand that uh, the reviews are positive reviews or critical and negative reviews. Other uh, applications or websites, such as Grammarly, has wider range of emotional uh, for the text. For example, the first sentence is personable, and the second uh, table, uh, the, the second sentence shows confidence. Email filtering is what you uh, every day see. A scam or junk, and also Gmail has an option that categorizes uh, the emails into different categories. For example, here the promotions is um, a category that contains only the emails that are about promotion. Uh, Google Translate is an uh, is. Uh, an example of language uh, translation, uh, which is one of the application of NLP, and I every day use uh, Google uh, Translate in my routine life, and I'm sure that everyone uses that whenever you go abroad. So uh, you use uh, Google Translate, which is NLP. NLP also is able to predict and suggest text. Uh, this is how Outlook, how email and messengers uh, predict and suggest uh, the, uh, the sentences to us. And I know that sometimes it's really frustrating. ChatGPT is one of the most popular uh, application these days. It's a chatbot. Chatbots is uh, NLP application is one of the NLP application. Uh, so the, the bridge between human, uh, human and computer, uh, uh, the gap between human and computer is, uh, is uh, smaller and lower now. Uh, and you can speak with chat GPT easier than before. And customer service is also another chatbot. A smart assist. Uh, you use uh, your iPhone. Siri on your phone is an Apple's virtual assistant. My Siri is resp <laughs> responding to me right now. Uh, and uh, Siri uh, on your phone is an Apple's virtual assistant, uses advanced, uh, advanced uh, NLP techniques and speech recognition to understand and respond to user queries. First, Siri needs to transcribe a spoken word into the text and then understand the meaning of the text. After that, based on the condition, context of query, the location of user, the time of day, and any from the device or user's history, Siri will answer to you. Uh, let's see the applications of NLP in healthcare. NLP is gaining popularity in healthcare as it can analyze large quantities of unstructured medical data, such as doctor, a doctor's notes, medical records, cl clinical re reports, and even the service reviews that patient posted on social media. You know, 
uh, 80% of healthcare data is unstructured. So we might miss many of them if we don't use NLP. Um, and with NLP, we can utilize its full potential. Uh, yes, not full, but we can use it better. NLP can change unstructured data by analyzing it and extracting insight to guide doctors and pharmacies to make more informed decisions. And also NLP can improve research and help researchers. Here is a list of NLP applications in healthcare. Um, NLP can improve both patient outcomes and operational efficiency. Uh, EHR is one of the most famous, uh, uh, EHR data extraction is one of the most famous application of NLP in healthcare. And NLP in healthcare not only enhance patient care, but also help it a streamlining administrative processes leading to cost saving and improved healthcare delivery. And now Sahela uh, will discuss about NLP, its applications in healthcare, some example tools of NLP in more details. Thank you, Dorsa, and hello, everyone. I'm Sohela, and I'm so excited being here presenting uh, this topic, and thank you for joining this talk today. Um, let me share my screen. So, can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, so as Dorsa, Dorsa mentioned, there are many applications for um, NLP in uh, healthcare. One of them is enhancing clinical document, documentation through speech recognition. Research showed that doctors spend about 60 minutes on EHR, which is uh, really uh, too much time for each patient. And... Um, if we can reduce this time, we can uh, reduce the burnout of doctors and use their time in more effective uh, way. So uh, Dragon Medical One is a tool, is a speech recognition tool, which presents a tool, a speech to text conversion tool. And by using Dragon Medical One, um, Doctors can just speak and the tool itself uh, convert this speech to text. So uh, in other hand, medical staff can also query the NLP tools to extract relevant data from EHRs. They claim that in their website, they claim that they cut time spent on clinical documentation by half. And also Concord Hospital uh, deployed this tool and uh, they claim that 60% reduction in time is spent completing the nursing triage notes and also 70% and 75% of um, accuracy increase in uh, clinical documentation accuracy. So this is one of the application of uh, NLP in uh, healthcare. Uh, and uh, you can see their uh, video, which shows a, a doctor talk, and then the application changes to to text. No rash or lesions. Left foot pressure also. Next field. Abdomen shows mild suprapubic tenderness with no renal tenderness. Stop. Next field. One. Stop. Acute urinary tract infection without evidence of systemic infection. Stop. FPC normal. Renal function normal. Urinalysis abnormal. Iuria with bacteria and positive nitrates noted. Stop. New line. Two. Stop. Diabetes mellitus. As you see, it's very effective tool because uh, the doctor only need to speak and then the tools itself uh, turn it to text. So... This is one of the very great application of uh, NLP. 
Nope. Sorry. There are also more applications, like uh, one of them is supporting doctors in decision making. So NLP can uh, analyze those vast clinical documents and support physician in their decision making. Uh, one of the example of this, uh, this one is IBM Watson for oncology, which is a solution uh, designed to analyze patient data and it used thousands of historical cases and insights from thousands of MND, MDs and analysts. So uh, what IBM Watson for oncology provide evidence-based uh, treatment option to doctors and help doctors in their decision-making uh, process. Um, another useful um, application for um, healthcare is medical coding and dealing. So we have some expert in uh, hospitals or anywhere which uh, read texts and uh, turn them into ICD-10 codes. So these manual coding is very slow and prone to error. But these tool, uh, which name is 3M and Compass System, this, this tool is something that we can use it and they have a website. It's an NLP powered uh, computer assistant coding tool and they hired about 200 um, experts in coding and billing and they developed this uh, application and they, uh, you can you easily use it. So, based, so if you see this uh, for, um, picture here, Based on these texts, they can just uh, recognize, for example, disease category or part of body, and then uh, change these texts to ICD-10 code. So this is um, more robust and uh, we can have less error. And also we can reduce the amount of money we spend and uh, number of people we need to in our uh, group. Another um, application for um, NLP in healthcare is predictive analytics. Uh, one of them is risk adjustment and um, hierarchical condition category, which is a risk adjustment model. So NLP can um, analyze uh, all the um, clinical nodes and based on those nodes and ICD-10 codes, uh, they can, and the NLP can assign a score to a patient um, which shows that patient how much that patient will cost in their future. Or another predictive analytics um, example is, this one is a research um, and they show how they can use NLP to identify and uh, to identify risk, uh, risk and predict risk for hospitalization for heart failure patient. So they use NLP for uh, and analyze free text reports for 24 hours. And then um, based on those um, analysis, they can predict um, the risk of hospital readmission and mortality within 30 days. So as you see, uh, we can use NLP in both industry for healthcare and research. And as Dorsa mentioned, 80% of um, healthcare data is on a structure. So we are missing a huge amount of data so we need to uh, do, do some, um, like, I mean, we, we need to use NLP to uh, work on those part of data as well. Um, other application of NLP is, for example, OCR, which converts um, printed and handwritten text to machine readable format or uh, text classification, which we can assign a label uh, to a text. For example, we can label a patient as at risk of hospitalization based on certain keywords in medical notes. Or we can use topic modeling, which we can sort information based on common topics. For example, we can group together all doctor's notes uh, on patients suffering uh, from a specific disorder. And uh, by having all those group uh, notes, we can like have a better idea of that kind of a specific disorder. So the application of uh, NLP in healthcare is not limited to what we present uh, here today. This is just, uh, these, these were just examples of uh, application of NLP. Um, 
and uh, we can do a lot with NLP in, um, in healthcare. So for now, I'm going to talk about techniques in NLP. Um, what I'm going to present is traditional NLP and basics of techniques in NLP. Uh, nowadays, we have very advanced um, models like ChatGPT. We can easily talk to ChatGPT as a, like uh, similar to a human. Uh, but um, I think we need to know the foundation of NLP and the basic uh, technology and methods of uh, NLP first, and then uh, dive deeper to like a uh, more advanced technique. So for presenting uh, the techniques in NLP, I'm going to do that with uh, an example, which is a sentiment analysis task. Uh, as Dorsa mentioned, sentiment analysis tags is one of the famous tasks of um, NLP. And by using that, we can, um, like say, if a text or a tweet or a review is negative, positive, or whatever. So before that, I need to um, talk a little about supervised machine learning because these past sentiment analysis we are going to use supervised machine, learn machine learning for this. Uh, we have different kinds of machine learning, supervised, semi-supervised, and uh, unsupervised machine learning. In sentiment analysis, we use supervised one. In supervised machine learning, uh, we have a set of data. And in for each data instance, we have features and also label. It's like how we teach a child um, like understand the difference between apple and orange. For example, we show thousands of pictures of apple and orange to child, and then after thousand iteration, it she or he can say if a new uh, image is apple or orange. So we go the same procedure from machine and uh, give a set of um, training data, which has the label itself. And then uh, after many iterations, like millions of iterations, the machine learns uh, the data. So it's like uh, we have feature and then we input features to our prediction function and uh, gain the output, which is y hat. And then we calculate the cost based on our y hat, which is our output and the real label. And based on this cost, we tune our parameter. So after millions of iteration, we kind of find the um, near to optimize parameter. And then with that par parameter, we can um, predict the label for a new data instance. So that was uh, supervised machine learning. But for using supervised machine learning on text, we cannot give a plain text to machine. We need to change the text into some different features. As you see here, we have feature one, feature two, feature three. So we need to change text into features. To do that, we have different kind of um, techniques. One of the simplest way to do, to do this is, uh, for example, we have a set of tweets. Uh, I'm happy because I'm learning NLP. I hated the movie. So just consider we have 1 million tweets here. And based on these tweets, this is our dictionary. And based on these tweets, we create a vector uh, consist of every distinct word. So the vector would be, will be like, again, millions of words. And then for each new tweet, we can create a vector for that tweet. And based on the presence of each word, we assign one or zero. For example, here we have I, so it's one. We have am in our tweet, so it's one. We don't have hated, so it's zero. So for each tweet, we have a vector consists of a few one and a lot of zero. So we call this technique, uh, this one is a sparse representation because most of the value in our vector is zero. 
So what's the problem with with sparse representation? The problem is it's it has a large uh, I mean it has a large vector for each tweet, and this this with and and it. At the end, we will have large training time as well, and we will have large prediction time. So it's not a, it's not an effective uh, way to um, present those tweets into um, features. Another approach for these tasks for these tasks, I mean the task of sentiment analysis, which we want to uh, label each tweet as positive or negative. Another uh, solution is having two different dictionary, one for positive tweets and one for negative tweets. And as I already said, we, we, we have the label for each tweet. We know that I am happy because I'm learning NLP is positive tweet. So we consider it in our uh, positive dictionary and we also have a negative dictionary. And then we will create a table and we count the frequency of each word in positive tweets and each word in negative tweets. So the set of our vocabulary is this, based on all the words in both and dictionary. And then we have a set of positive frequency, which we count the words uh, it presents uh, in positive tweets. For example, I... Uh, present in three times in positive tweets so it's three or happy we can see happy two times in positive tweets so it's two here or we don't have any happy in negative tweets so the frequency of happy in negative um, mapping is zero so we will create these uh, dictionary and we will create these two positive frequency and negative frequency based on our dictionary and then again, for each tweet, for each new tweet, we will uh, count the frequency for that tweet. For example, this tweet, I am sad, I'm not learning NLP. Uh, we want to calculate the positive frequency. Okay, so we have I, which is three, M, which is three, sad is zero in positive frequency. Again, I, M, not is zero, learning is one, and NLP is one. So the sum of these number will, will be eight. So the frequency of positive uh, frequency for this specific tweet is eight. And we should calculate for all, for all new tweets, these positive frequency and negative frequency. One thing that uh, I want to mention is some words like happy, it, it uh, clearly shows that uh, happy is uh, two in our positive frequency and it's zero in negative frequency. And our just consider that our uh, dictionary is very limited right now. If we had like millions of tweets, uh, the difference would be much uh, bigger than that. But some words like I and am doesn't have any meaning in I mean, it doesn't show any positivity or negativity. So it doesn't change anything at the end. It's only increase our vocabulary set. So one of the main uh, pre-processing step in uh, NLP is removing these stop words. So we will remove and, is, or, and some. It, the list is very uh, bigger than this. So this is one of the one of the very important uh, pre-processing step in NLP. We should uh, we have to remove stop words before any uh, anything else, and also we should uh, remove punctuation. So after removing, for for example, for this tweet, after removing stop words, it will be like that, and then we will re remove punctuation. And also we can remove handles and URLs. So at the end, the tweet will will be like tuning great AI model. Another pre-processing step is stemming. We don't need to have tune, tuned and tuning all these three in our vocabulary sets because it's all have kind of same meaning and it doesn't change the um, final result. So we will do a stemming and it's, instead of these three uh, verbs, we only use tune. And by using this, 
we will decrease the um, vocabulary set. Also, we don't need to have different kind of grades. It's all great and it's all, it's all have same meaning. So another pre-processing step is lower casing. So at the end, our tweet will be like tuned great AI mo model, Just only these four words. Or another example, we have this tweet, I'm happy because I'm learning NLP at Sign Deep Learning. We need, we, in the pre-processing step, we remove stop word, which is I am, I am, and because these are all stop words. And also we will remove handling, which is deep learning. And then we turn learning to learn. This is the stemming pre-processing. So at the end, this tweet uh, will be happy, learn, and NLP, just these three words. And based on our positive frequency and negative frequency table, we will calculate the sum positive frequency, which is four, because happy is two, learn is one, and NLP is one, so it's four. And some negative frequency will be two. So we will do this process for all tweets. So at the end, we will have a matrix uh, with M rows, which is our M tweets. So this is the general implementation. At first, we will build our frequency dictionary and then for each tweet, we uh, pre-process the tweet and then we extract features. And after extracting these features, we can give these features into a machine learning uh, algorithm. Like for this task, uh, we can use uh, logistic regression and logistic regression can use this feature and uh, turn it to label. So what we uh, what I present right now was very basic um, technique for NLP, but there are a lot more in uh, and we have a lot issue because human language is very complex. For example, in healthcare um, system, for example. If we have, we want to know if uh, a patient have support um, in hospital hospitalization. If in in the note it says relative at bedside, we by this uh, phrase we can understand that that patient have support. But by using basic tech, um, NLP technique, we cannot the the machine cannot understand. It means that the patient have support. So it's kind of inferences uh, that um, machine cannot do. Or semantic beyond keywords. Just consider the sparse representation which we, uh, which I already um, present. If we use that sparse representation, these two sentences would be the same. Wife helps patient with medication or patient helps wife, uh, wife with medication. These two sentences have exactly same words, and it's hard for machine to understand the difference, which uh, the difference is very uh, obvious and important. <clears throat> or another thing uh, is negation. For example, a brain malignancy was ruled out. A simple NLP uh, technique uh, would consider this one as a presence of disease, which is not, and it's exactly opposite. So these are the um, clue for us to use more advanced uh, NLP. For example, uh, we should use uh, contextual based um, technique like GPT or BERT or some machine learning methods uh, learn patterns and then can uh, understand these um, different contextual information. But we cannot uh, do that with um, basic NLP. However, uh, I'm sure basic NLP can be useful in some, um, some application, but in many applications, we need to have more advanced NLP. Okay, and now I wanna a bit talk about challenges and limitation because uh, NLP have advanced in uh, in general, like chat GPT is uh, like the ultimate goal of NLP right now. And um, in 
AI community, people um, somehow like uh, somehow thinks that um, it's the end of NLP and we don't need NLP expert anymore. Like even at least in five years, because ChatGPT is the ultimate and did a lot. But it's kind of different in um, healthcare sector because of these limitations I'm going to present. <clears throat> One of them is this, uh, the bias and fairness consideration is uh, similar for both uh, healthcare and general. For example, um, especially for NLP in health, the data are uh, mostly are, is very unbalanced. For example, if we um, give a child, like if we give a machine like 90% apple and 10% orange, and then show a new image, that machine tends to answer apple because it uh, see apples more than uh, orange. So if we have unbalanced data set, we will have bias in our results. This is one uh, problem in uh, healthcare and it might be in some other uh, sectors as well. Another thing is gender bias, which is common in many uh, uh, sectors, like GPT-3 associates male with high education jobs and female with uh, low knowledge intensive uh, role. So this is kind of bias. Or uh, healthcare AI, um, an algorithm underestimate care of black patient due to historically um, they spent uh, less money spent on, um, I'm sorry, more uh, money spent on white uh, people care. So AI uh, underestimate the care for black patient. So these are the example of bias in uh, healthcare and also in general. So one of the problem is machine learning method and deep learning methods are mostly like black box and we don't we don't know what process um, is going on in that black box so we cannot have uh, any idea of what happened and what is the uh, decision making process so one of the hot topic uh, explainable ai is one of the hot topic topics in uh, nowadays because we can, and we specifically can use explain, explainable AI in healthcare because it allows us to have justification for each recommendation and it helps us to avoid bias. Or another ap approach is cu uh, using curated data set, but this one is not a scalable for large data set. So these are somehow solution for um, fairness and bias. Another uh, issue in uh, healthcare system is data quality and also privacy and security concern. I think these concerns are very important in healthcare. For example, um, one of the problem is integration with legacy system because we cannot um, integrate AI with outdated legacy system. And also, on the other hand, uh, we mostly have insufficient training data and data from um, medical facilities are not high quality and they not show um, the, they are not a very good uh, representation of the target population. And Another problem is eti ethical consideration because if we use uh, AI in a, in a treatment procedure and we um, make a decision based on AI, at the end, the question is who is responsible for outcome? So this one is very important. And uh, I think that these, these three problem is one of our most uh, important problem that we haven't have NLP in healthcare uh, that much. So, and for future direction, I think uh, we should um, find answer for the uh, limitation that I already present, 
like ethical consideration and also privacy consideration. For example, for OHDPQ, we have too many steps for, uh, like connecting to VPN and then uh, entering our password a couple of times and then we can have access to data. So it's not easy to work on um, healthcare data without considering uh, privacy and security. And also uh, there are a lot of um, application that needed to be addressed and we can we can uh, use NLP to um, create some application for uh, healthcare sectors. So that was our presentation and um, I hope that this presentation be a start point for some new research on NLP in healthcare or even developing the tools. And Dorsa and I are here to answer your question. Thank you so much, both of you. That was fascinating. And I just, I imagine there's lots of questions in the room and I'm what I'll do is also put your emails in the chat too. Because what we really hope with Methods Monday here, in particular this talk, was to get people thinking about, you know, in your own work, how you might use NLP and knowing that Doris and Sohila are here as incredible resources as you can imagine. Um, and so we'll just, I'll stop talking. I've, I've lots of questions too, just thinking about even locally what we might do. But if people have some questions in the chat or they want to un unmute or put their camera on. We've got Dorsa and Sohila here for another 15 minutes of their expertise. Um, yes, go ahead. Hi. Hi, hi, hi Dor Dorsa. Uh, Sohila, uh, a very wonderful talk. Uh, uh, it's very interesting to know NLP have more application here. So just self-introduction. My name is Xiaodan Zhu. I'm actually always Queen's Engineering here. As Miss Engineering work on NLP uh, for several years, we collaborated with like uh, uh, Amber Simpson and uh, other like uh, Elham from York University solving several problems. Uh, yeah, again, so it's very uh, it's, it's fantastic here. If there's a chance we collaborate in this a new like collective mind uh, framework. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, so I have two specific questions. Uh, I think so far, uh, two challenges many people face on NLP for health is uh, number one, uh, one is like a privacy. Um, because many models are pre-trained, and whenever you fine-tune the model, you publish the model, the model may still leak the information. Yes. So um, in that case, like, uh, do you, uh, are you thinking about some work like uh, to enhance the privacy, specifically in the new area of like a uh, large language model, uh, pre-trained fine-tuning framework? So that's, yeah. uh, that's I think uh, it's an important, very important problem. Yes, yeah, that, that was a great question. Uh, actually, we have some pre-trained model. I use like one of them in one of our research for uh, the classification, uh, medical data classification. We have some limited uh, pre-trained model for like birds. But as you said, we cannot easily um, publish our pre-trained model because of privacy. So and that's that's one of the one of the main problem and main limitation in healthcare system. So I have not a specific answer to this question, but I can say we have some limited pre-trained model already. I see. Yeah, that's that'd be very uh, interesting domain to to think of, like uh, to potential collaborate. Uh, I've just a very quick uh, second question. Another big challenge people face is like a multimodality of the medical domain. Because so far we know there's only a pre-trained large language model, but for image data in like in medical domain, sometimes you have multi-modality data. But yeah. often people find that like you don't have pre-trained data, a pre-trained large language, pre-trained large models for other other modality. So that's can can heavily uh, limit the application of NLP for for healthcare. So yeah. like for your research, are you also considering like a multi-modality, like use image data and the text data all together? Because like uh, the, the uh, I have some students try to combine image data and text data, but the problem is text data you have larger language model, but image data, um, I mean, especially like image data, you don't have specific uh, easy way to to do that. i mean, yeah, just my question is like uh, for your research, because I really hope there's potential collaboration here under the uh, connected mind. But uh, the question is like for your research, are you also using like a uh, uh, considering multimodality data? Uh 
we haven't do we haven't do that and done that in our uh, uh, current job, but um, I have a very um, I have experience in that, but I we we didn't finish that project unfortunately. But we were trying to use uh, his pathology his pathology images and also uh, NLP and using multimodal uh, data set. But the problem was. In his pathology, we have images, but we didn't have uh, text easily. So the problem is in most sector, we don't have both data to use multimodal. So that's a very, uh, that's a, a problem uh, we face in uh, healthcare. So if we have data, we can do something, but uh, the problem is still data. Thank you. Yeah, I don't want to use all the 50 minutes, but just say hello in that. I think uh, this is a fantastic program. Probably we can talk more later too for potential collaborations. <laughs> yeah, and thank you Enjoy so much. Enjoy the talk. Thank you so much for those questions. I Just highlighting this idea for collaboration and, and for those of you who are part of Connected Minds, there's a large funding call coming out just in thinking about how multiple perspectives and disciplines can collaborate. So, you know, thinking of AI and, and your own work with through Amber and... and um, computer sciences. So thanks for that question and the nudge for collaboration. Nora, you've got your hand up. Uh, thank you, Catherine. So uh, my question is going to be a, a lot less informed than the previous one. And I'm coming at this from the point of view of a person who uh, created a lot of their own models in their training. Um, and I'm trying to um, get from your talk, what is the added value of AI relative to traditional model building or model testing. Um, and so part of my uh, challenge in understanding that is figuring out what exactly is um, the algorithm doing and what needs to be done by a human. So um, for example, one of the things that you mentioned was um, like how you, it was, um, you divided the text into um, text that originated from some type of grouping of text that I, I don't know if you called that a vector or if that was a feature, um, but that that was um, one was positive and one was negative, and then you could do a frequency count based on that. So, for example, that example brings up to me the issue of like, how do you know what it's positive or negative text? Who tells the the system, what that is, and does that still need to be done by humans? So um, in order for the machine to learn. And um, so I guess that's one of the things that really makes me think about that is I used to work in classification of um, uh, questions, questionnaire questions, um, using um, alphanumeric World Health Organization codes. And, and just the way we went about doing that was infinitely more complex than then uh, we realized, you know, we, we sought out ontology methods, we sought out linguistic methods for doing it. And there was no one method that could ever like label data the way a human labels data. And we, I'm still kind of seeing that till now. So I'm just wondering how that works with natural language processing. Thank you, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, actually in that um, example that I present, uh, this one is very basic, example and we as i said in supervised machine learning we have the label for a training uh, data set so uh we already have those label i mean those positive label and negative label for that example but your question is still um very important especially in uh, healthcare uh, sector for example in general machine learning we have large data set designed and curated by large groups like CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, which is um, image data set. And they have been classified already by humans. So for example, we have millions of uh, images and um, a, like a group did that. And uh, we have millions of images with label. Yeah don't have this resource in um, healthcare. We mostly don't have this kind of resource in healthcare. So that's one of the main challenges for healthcare research on uh, for AI. So, but my qu my question is, how did the machine know that one sentence was a positive sentence and the other sentence was a negative? As, as I said, we already have. I mean, a 
big part of data, we already have label for that. So it's 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 previously labeled by yeah, it, exactly. and it was okay. Yeah. The kind of dictionary. Yeah. yeah. So this this we can use these these kind of methods for supervised machine learning. Yes. If we don't have label, we should go with unsupervised machine learning, or Thank we you. could use some group and label data. Yes. And then I think you um, um, alluded to this and I'll just, um, I, I think I know the answer based on something you said, but I just wanted to make sure. Um, when you said it's uh, encountered with a new piece of data and it can't figure out how to classify it, like in that, in the case where it was positive or negative, it, does it, it, does it force a piece of data into a classification? And, does, and the rule for that is usually what it's expecting to see based on, based on what it's seen. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's how it works. Okay, thank you. That helps me a lot. <laughs> no worries. Thank you for asking this question. That was great. Thanks, Nora. I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> like, are you thinking of using NLP in your work or... I'm I'm curious because I, I can are you asking me? Yeah, yeah. I'm, it would be a good fit all the time. I think about it all the time, and mm -hmm. so so I'm I'm trying to figure out what uh, what it would be, where it would add a lot of value, mm -hmm. and what I would have to um, constrain constrain it to do. And um, yeah, so yeah. Mm -hmm. well, thanks for that question. I don't know if others have have some questions. Um, Sherry's got a question just sort of like from a broad scale, like estimating the time frame, which you imagine to see NLP utilized on a broad scale to reduce administrative burden in healthcare. I know um, there's like scribes now that's being used. Yeah, um, that's a tough question. And I think I'm not enough expert to answer this, but I'm very optimistic. And I think uh, like ChatGPT is, he make a huge difference in NLP world. So uh, I think if human can uh, develop something like ChatGPT, they can also develop something for uh, healthcare as well. So I can see it in like five years or like this. I, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm very optimistic. So we should see what happens in the future. Mm -hmm. And because of, sorry. No, go, go ahead, Dorothy. Because of the limitation and challenges that are in healthcare, I think it takes more than usual time uh, in compare with the other uh, area. Yeah, I can say we already have the technique to uh, just reduce this bur burden, but the main problem is like those privacy limitation. Yes. And also healthcare area is really important. We cannot accept wrong yes. things mm -hmm. in this area. That's why we should NLP should focus more on uh, healthcare to have a correct answer. Yes, exactly. And is there certain parts because you're obviously much more? I'm just very new to and thinking about how this could be used. Is there part, certain sectors in healthcare that it's being more used in? Like, I'm just thinking like primary care, you know, with all their EMR data, like, is there, is it more hospital-based, community-based? Like, it sounds like so much is more physician-based because a lot of it is around prediction and decision-making diagnostics, you know, coming from the field of, of rehabilitation where it's a little bit messier and it's not like clear cut. Um, I can see, and we don't have an, as much sort of volumes of data to sort of feed into the system. Um, as far as I know, the sectors that's working with images are more developed than texts. Uh, I'm not sure why. Maybe it's more uh, like we can use the um, images data, right? Um, we, have, we can access that easily, but... I'm not sure which sector works on NLP. Mm -hmm. And I see Rosemary popped in NPs in the chat too, because that's, you know, right now, like so much is focused on the physicians is thinking like, how do we like unburden the system to looking at the other health professions and like thinking about how we might use NLP to understand some of those roles and how they might contribute to like lessening the burden sort of just on, I'm just thinking like, and we think family physicians, for instance. Yeah. 
I'm just putting a plug in, and I know people might may or may not know this, um, but at Queen's, the Department of Family Medicine has this interesting platform. It's called QFAMR, and it's essentially where it's a secure platform where um, the open text EMRs are, are actually stored so you can start to, to work and, and use NLP, which we're going to be doing in a project coming up, Sohil and, and Dorsa, which you, you know of. Um, Rosemary. Yeah, sorry, I'm multitasking, eating lunch and listening. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, do you know, so I'm not so involved with the implementation of Lumio, which is the new um, electronic doc electronic documentation and, and e EHR that's being implemented at uh, not just KHSC, but, uh, but certainly beyond. Um, certainly our current system, the PCS or MISIS, as it was called when I first came here almost 25 years ago, um, the most of our documents are scanned into the scan scanned into the system as a PDF, uh, which makes pulling those data completely impossible. Except if you can sit there and you know document it that way. Do you know anything about Lumio and whether or not we'd be able to pull some of the narrative data? Because you know with dictations and things like that, so much rich data that that are there that we could be using. Okay. Uh, I haven't heard of Lumio, but uh, yeah, the problem you mentioned is just extracting those data into some uh, PDF. Because I know there are some tools that can uh, change, like hand. There, there are already some tools for uh, converting handwritten data to like text data, uh, but we, sh we you should at first take pictures of those handwritten and then do that. Or also, I think there are some tools like OCR can change um, handwritten data and also like PDF data into text. So there already are some tools for that. Yeah, that's a great point. I was just thinking like in the EMR primary care, per for instance, like so many PDFs come from consults, referrals that, that are these critical decision points. Yeah, that's great. Um, Nora, I think this will be the last question, just looking at it, a few minutes to one. Only if there's no one else, because I've already I've already gone. But j j one of my the things that lit up for me that I can imagine is a privacy barrier right from the get go, but would be the one of the most useful applications would be just a, a scan that can pull certain codes or diagnoses or or um, activities um, from the beginning just to cut down to identify uh, potential participants that could later be screened by human beings. They, I mean, they don't have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. They don't have to have high sensitivity and specificity necessarily if they're going to be further, well, more sensitivity, but um, if they're going to be further screened. But uh, yeah, that, that to me would be a, a really big win is just something that could uh, when you have a general population you're interested in, something that could mine uh, possibilities for narrowing down that population would be huge. But again, I can imagine that it there would be privacy barriers. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Nora. Last question for Hannah, if you'd like to go ahead. Hi. Um, so thank you very much, Eric. It was a great talk. Uh, so about the NLP uh, text data, um, uh, uh, it was mentioned that if Farmer, like Queen's Family Health Team, UFHT, um, has some data. It's under Sipson. So I've done some work uh, in that regard um, with Queen's uh, Family uh, Health um, doctors. Uh, one thing that I, from the computer science department, struggle with is to find a really interesting problem. And mm -hmm. of course, the relevant data, right? So um, We've done recently some some uh, projects with uh, Roche and uh, Pfizer, and with with specific questions given, then it's easier for computer scientists to say collaborate with other people. Um, so it would be nice um, if we can uh, get some of these questions uh, uh, raised uh, for for you know extending the collaboration. Um, and uh, Sipson is a great source uh, for this kind of data. It is a hassle to get access to the data. Um, a lot of, you know, processing and paperwork needed, but yes, they have chart note data, they have image data, they have all kinds of data. So 
I hope if um, this, um, uh, you know, the connected mind uh, can facilitate yes. uh, in general uh, the yes. access to the data, and then I think many more collaborations could be, you know, fostered uh, through this kind of funding. That's great. That's Thank a great way to. That's a great way to end this. Just also popping up. I put the link to the connected minds, and also there's lots of interesting opportunities here, like you had mentioned through Sipson, the Department of Family Medicine, and and their platform. So if there's some interest, I've got Sohila and Dorsa's email um, in the text in the in the chat. They're great to reach out to, and it'd be wonderful for Hannah just to think about some collaborations and some of those really great questions to to use this data. Thanks, everyone. The second Methods Monday and another great success. So thank you so much, both of you, for the presentation. Really, really interesting. Have a great day, everybody.